afternoon and uh, welcome to the Cape Town Press Club lunch. Um, today we are also live streaming the event um, with the generous support of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, a thank you to our other sponsors, Tsitsikama for the water, Distel for the wines, the Ben and Shirley Rabinovitz Foundation. Uh, just a reminder, please adhere to the COVID protocols. Uh, we are in the fourth wave. Um, we don't know how many Omicrons are here with us today. And to um, but if you leave your table, please ask. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, some new members, Christine Cooper, Howard Butcher, Derek, Stefan Lejeune, and the diplomats we have today from India, Spain, Switzerland, Russia, and the USA. Upcoming events, we have Dion Wiggett on the 19th of January, and we have Gwen Lister giving us the Barry Street Memorial Lecture on the 29th of January. Uh, this will be, I think, our last function for 2021. Today, we welcome Wayne Sussman for a tour through the 2021 local government elections. Uh, now that the figures are thoroughly crunched, and I think the election only got more and more exciting after it happened. Um, he's fondly known as the election geek. Um, we're in very good hands with one of the best, our go-to guy. He was the analyst for the Daily Maverick this year. He also writes regularly for Business Day. So please welcome Wayne. Thank you, thank you. It's really great to be here. And I can't believe that I'm the last speaker for the year, so there's a lot of pressure on my shoulders for the future of the Cape Town Press Club. So Lelage, I know it was very, very difficult to deal with, um, so I hope I don't disappoint you again. I don't think I will. Brent, it's a real honor to be here. As I said, um, South Africa is often short, and he doesn't like being typecast like this, but South Africans are, we often short of great food reviewers and restaurant writers, and Brent is much more than that, but his writings on many of Cape Town's great restaurants I remember with fondness, so thank you. It's great to be hosted by you. Thank you to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for uh, booking my tickets and bringing me here. Um, I think our elections was possibly, even though it was yours in Germany was fascinating, I think ours was also fascinating. The other thing I want to apologize for is that I'm not, sadly, an epidemiologist. Um, a month ago was the 1st of November. By the way, the weather, if you remember, you from Cape Town, was very, very different one month ago. It's a really glorious day. But a month is... Uh, a long time, particularly in 2021, and I hope what I'm going to say is not old news. Um, I said to Brent that if you want to bring an epidemiologist, I'd happily step aside. I didn't say that, but uh, I know that that's what's on everyone's mind right now. Omicron happened north or south of the Orange River, but let's try what happened north or south of the Orange River, uh, very relevant to our lives in the next hour. So it's really great to be here. So I want to ask, I'll try to answer three questions today. I might call on Anthony Butler to speak about Sora Ramaphosa if I fail, uh, but I will try my darndest. So who are the winners and the losers of this election is the first question I'll try to answer. The second one is, will these results see an improvement in local government and an improvement in the economy and an improvement in business? Are we going to see a difference uh, when it comes to service delivery in the cities and towns across South Africa in the next five years, particularly now that many, many more South Africans live in the age of coalitions. And finally, what does this mean for 2024? Uh, 2024 isn't so far away. That is when the next provincial and national elections will be. So uh, I did part of this presentation in haste. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, somewhat critical of myself because I always say to people when I ask them their predictions for the elections, I say, remember, it's got to add to 100. And embarrassingly, I just checked that one of uh, the data points here adds to 101. But let's, uh, you'll forgive me for that. But this is fascinating. What, if you follow my writing, I always compare past results because it's one thing saying the ANC got 46%, but we have to compare it relatively. 
And in 2016, the ANC got 54%. But I want us to focus on the numbers in brackets. There are some mathematicians here, some business people. But uh, when you take 54% with what the ANC got in 2016, plus 27%, plus 8%, that adds to about 89% uh, of the vote. Uh, am I correct? Uh, 54, 81, 89% of the vote. So the big three parties in 2016 get almost 90% of the vote. And of course the ANC won by far the majority of that, but that is fascinating. Let's compare it with what happened in this election. And there you see it, 78%. So this just shows you by looking at this first slide, that a lot of South Africans' votes went in another direction in this election. And that's fascinating. Let's try and pack that uh, in the next few minutes. But let's just focus, and I'm going to go through each party one by one, but this was a fascinating election. Because usually in an election, if the big party is falling, the second biggest party, which is the Democratic Alliance, should be the beneficiary. But we see the DA also losing a lot of ground. In between, if one takes the ANC and DA's combined vote, they are essentially losing 13% of the vote. So if we use that similar principle, if the biggest party and the second biggest party are not the main beneficiaries, then one would expect the third biggest party, the EFF, to be a large beneficiary. But the EFF only grew slightly, and we'll, try, and we'll unpack that as well. They grew from 8 to 10%. So those are the... Uh, the three biggest parties, we saw a return of the IFP getting 6% of the vote, and we'll go into that also during this presentation. And then, look, it's a low base, and that's why I started using uh, more decimal points once we get below the 6% mark, but the Freedom Front had a terrific election, going from 0.73% to 2.34%, and then Action SA, only contesting in six municipalities. You didn't even see them on the ballot paper in the Western Cape in their first election getting 2.34%, slightly less than the Freedom Front. That is a, an impressive debut, and we'll unpack that also. The Patriotic Alliance uh, getting 0.97%. Again, what did they do last time? They barely registered across the, across the country. They contested in all nine provinces, if I remember correctly, in 2016. They only got 0.07% 0 0 of the vote. Here they get just under 1%. I'm sure that the press club rightly hosted mayoral candidate Brett Heron and the Good Party. I understand they wouldn't have invited the Patriotic Alliance, but this party had a much bigger impact on the elections than Patricia Little's Good, and we'll try and understand that as well. Um, and then independent candidates. They did better this time round, and I'm sorry to say, and I'll get to Musi Maimani later, he cannot claim all the independent candidates because they are by their very nature independent. He hasn't asked them whether he can represent them or be their spokesperson. People become independent candidates for different reasons. Now, this is an increase. 1,73% is certainly better than 1,14%, but one of the reasons why, there was almost a uh, double the amount of independent candidates in 2021. So a lot more South Africans saying, can we seek office? Can we get elected the independent route? And I think we saw about 20, uh, just over 50 independent candidates get elected this time. And then this is where it was my mathematical blunder, apologies, but uh, miscellaneous. And by this, I mean, this is a ridiculous category. So on the one hand, I'm including parties which are established like UDM and the ACDP and COPE but also a fascinating part of our elections, local parties. So let's just say, let's call it 9%. The, this was a huge increase. Remember in the first slide I said, where are all these votes from the large three uh, parties, uh, from the large two parties going? Some of it's going to the EFF, some of it's going to the Freedom Front, to the Patriotic Alliance and Action SA, but a lot of it went to local parties, and we'll also go through that. So these are just the headline numbers of what happened in, the, uh, in this election. Now, let's deal with the winners and the losers. Democratic participation. Fascinating. We have seen in the last few elections, in the national and provincial elections, the trend has been downward. Less South Africans have been voting in national and provincial elections. Of course, there have been more South Africans voting in national and provincial elections than local government elections. However, 
when one looks at the voter turnout between 2011 and 2006 and the voter turnout between 2016 and 2011, a different trajectory. More South Africans participating in local government elections. More South Africans, I would say, understanding how important these elections are. These elections are not about fiscal policy or economic policy or foreign policy or social policy. These elections are about my streetlights. These elections are about my neighborhood park. These elections are about refuse collection. Did that trend continue in this election? Falls to 46%. The low point of participation in local government elections was 48%. We had seen it creep up to above 58%. It fell to 46%. Now, one of the reasons for that might be the short time frame of this election. Another reason might have been that the election was on a Monday. We never have elections on a Monday in South Africa. Always a Wednesday, at some exception I have found on a Tuesday. I think that might have uh, contributed as well. But this fall from 58% to 46% is very, very worrying. Are more and more South Africans saying that we do not think that our votes at the ballot box make a difference to our lives and therefore we are no longer going to participate? So I would say democratic participation was a loser in this election. The Independent Electoral Commission. Um, what I say is if you're not going to vote in the election, rather go and participate and spoil your ballot. However, what I cannot stand um, is one, people not voting, but even more than that is when people have made the decision to go to vote and the IEC is the bottleneck. We know of many anecdotal examples in this election where those voter identification devices simply held up, um, simply held up the voting process. Remember, I just said in my previous slide, voter participation falls dramatically from 58% to 46%, but in many, uh, there are many anecdotal instances where people spend longer in the queue because of these voter identification devices. Now, we can forgive the IEC for the fact that they had a short time frame, but if uh, I think they led a lot to be desired, and I have great contacts in the IEC, but I sadly consider themselves one of the losers of this election. I think they could have done a better, um, a better job. So they are uh, in the loser category. Let's go to the African National Congress. Are they going to be in the winner category or the loser category? This is a stunning election for the ANC. For the first time in their history, for the first time since 1994, in a major election, the ANC falls below 50%, not just 49%, but to 46%. We saw the ANC um, not just suffer major setbacks in all but two of the eight metros. They just held on in Mangawung and Bloemfontein by one seat with an outright majority. But one of the pieces which I wrote about in the Daily Maverick was the decline of support in, in the ANC in large industrial towns. So yes, we focus mainly on the metros, but look at what happened to the ANC in places like Sasselberg in the Free State. Stunning uh, drop in support in places like Mfuleni, Ferenach and Van der Beel Park, the steel sector. We look at what happened in Richards Bay, Unklatuze, Newcastle, places like Mokhali City, Krugersdorp. There was a huge retreat um, and loss for the ANC in this regard. Was it all doom and gloom for the ANC? Certainly not. And I'm going to go into this when we speak about 2024 as well. They still have far more councillors than anyone else. Unlike the previous election, and this is a bit of a, a, a silly analytical comment I'm making, but they more than... So in the previous election, they were double the size of the DA, the second largest party. Actually, they're more than double the size of the second largest party this time around, but they have fallen below the 50% mark. They still have far many councillors, far more councillors than anyone else. They still govern a hell of a lot of municipalities. There are results in Limpopo and the Eastern Cape. In these toughest of times, in these grim economic times, in this time of COVID-19, their support largely holds in Limpopo and the Eastern Cape. And then we go to Buffalo City, which is one of the eight metros, East London, in the Eastern Cape. And they actually increase their support. So, if I'm the ANC in the next five years, 
I go and walk around Limpopo, walk around the Eastern Cape, particularly maybe hold a future conference in Buffalo, sit in East London and realize what are we doing well here uh, compared to what's happening in the rest of the country. So the ANC was certainly a loser in this election, but there are pockets of things which they can be proud of. I'm going to come to Nelson Mandela Bay later. They now have the mayorship again. They didn't have the mayorship in the last five years in Kabecha, um, in historic, formerly known as Port Elizabeth. They have the mayor there. That's something they can be proud of. We're going to get to Soro Ramaphosa later um, of what his leadership means for the ANC. And even though they've had two disastrous elections, why I think he'll be the guy who'll certainly remain in charge. This is a picture of the historic Mary Fitzgerald Square where the DA had their final election rally. What's telling about this picture is I wasn't expecting Action SA to do that well, and I can go into that a bit later. Um, and what was interesting, come this rally, there was panic in the DA camp. They realized that not only were they going to lose votes to the Freedom Front, we saw that happen in 2019, uh, particularly in the Northwest Province, but uh, not only were they continuing to lose votes to Gate and McKenzie's Patriotic Alliance, but they were now losing votes to, going to lose votes to uh, Herman Mashaba's Action SA as well. This was a very poor result for the DA. They didn't do, we knew they'd do worse than 2016, they actually did worse than 2011. And up until a few days ago, I would have said the DA, and maybe they should be for their, um, for their own sake, in somewhat of an existential crisis. Were they about to be uh, eclipsed historically uh, in the next election in 2024 by Action SA and others, or was there a path of hope for them? Um, you saw them lose ground in the Western Cape. Fascinating. One of the things I love doing is looking at the way seats move. And you can go to small councils in the western part of the Eastern Cape, near Jeffreys Bay, or in parts of the Western Cape Platteland, and it tells a lot of the difficult election story for the DA. One small town. Let's go to um, Carriado on, in the Lang Cliff, beautiful part of the country, the R62 road um, above Jeffreys Bay. The DA loses two seats. Who do they lose seats to? They lose one seat to the Freedom Front, one seat to the Patriotic Alliance. Just by looking at that result, it's saying that still for many Afrikaners, they're saying that the DA hasn't done enough to win them back. And more and more colored South Africans are saying that the DA is trying to be too many things to too many people. We want a party which represents us. So just by folks in that small council, you see a big trend. And then you saw the DA lose a lot of ground in places like Johannesburg to parties like Action SA. So this is going to be the challenge going forward. Can the DA, does the DA just write off those voters as losing to the Freedom Front and or the Patriotic Alliance and go after those voters who voted for Herman Mashaba? Or does it try to go after those Freedom Front voters and those Patriotic Alliance voters and forget about the voters voting for Herman Mashaba? That's the fine line the DA has to walk in the next few elections. Yes, they held on to the city of Cape Town, but the city of Cape Town is no longer the safest political metro in South Africa. That's now Buffalo City. Because the DA losing bits of ground to parties like the ACDP, parties like the Patriotic Alliance, parties uh, like Good to an extent. So this was a difficult election for the DA, but their story gets better after the elections. Um, and right now, we're just dealing with the election results. Um, in 2016, for me, the iconic image of the elections took place um, in Alexandra Township on a dusty day with Julius Malema flanked by the then Secretary General Godrich Gardi and Floyd Shavambu, his right hand. And it was on that day where the EFF made a stunning political announcement, where they said that we are not going to government with anyone, but we will support the opposition where we can from the outside. That, uh, I can show you that if you want to, I can show you off the, it's a famous picture. I, for me, this, this picture is the iconic picture of the 2021 elections. And when I first saw this picture, I thought, what the hell is Judas Malema celebrating? This was a celebration party about 10 days or two weeks after the elections. 
and Julius Malema, who, yes, his party increased from 8% to 10%, but I didn't think have much to show it. This was on Saturday, I think it was the 16th of November, or close uh, that, that particular Saturday, and here he was focusing very strongly on, um, on being a DJ. And, okay, so let's just step back while you look at that image. The EFF had brilliant results in KwaZulu-Natal. In Etiquani, uh, Durban, they have tripled the amount of councils from 8 to 24. They have grown across that province. One of the reasons why their votes went up in this election beca is because of their growth in KwaZulu-Natal. And by the way, there, was, um, there were signs of this coming in the 2019 election as well. Another province where the EFF does very well is in Mpumalanga. Uh, remember, if you remember the early elections, Mpumalanga and Limpopo always competed as the most, um, uh, as, as the most solid ANC province in the country. They make huge impact, uh, in, inroads in a place like Imbombela in Nelspruit, the capital of Mpumalanga, uh, where they, the ANC seat total dropped by 10 seats. I think the AN, EFFs grow, go, went up by about eight. So that was a very, very encouraging result. Small growth in the Western Cape, small growth in the Eastern Cape. But if they're tripling the amount of seats in a place like Durban, and that story is in a way replicating itself in other large uh, parts of KwaZulu-Natal, and they're growing in the Eastern Cape, and they're growing in the Western Cape, and they're certainly growing in Pumalanga, why didn't we see the EFF do much better? This is the challenge for the EFF. If one go, let's focus on two places now. It, to understand the EFF story and the way they um, grow, let's go to Polokwane, the capital city of Limpopo. Julius Malema's link is Sesheho Township, which is uh, one of the biggest townships in Polokwane. Uh, this is where they did well in their first elections in 2014 and in the first local government elections they contested in 2016. We go to Rustenburg, uh, which is the heart of the platinum belt. Uh, uh, there's one municipality in 2016 where the EFF could have had a mayor, it was there, because they brought the ANC under 50% and they were the second largest party. In both those places, the EFF lose a lot of ground, particularly in Rustenburg in this election. So they might be doing places like Durban and Mbombela, but they are losing ground in places where they've historically done well in. Is there a pattern emerging that the EFF can be appealing in one election, but not necessarily appealing in those same places in the second election? And that's something which I want to watch. And more worryingly, in many of the metro, in some of the three metros in Gauteng, I think it was Chwani, Pretoria, the EFF also loses a lot of seats. So if they're not growing in Gauteng, if they're not growing in the Northwest, if they're not growing in Limpopo, that is a something to be worried about. Having said that, they were the only, one of the only three parties to grow. Let's now move to the IFP. There is, um, I'm someone who loves grayness. If you want me to be negative about a party, I can find you nuggets of hope and positivity. If you want me to be positive about a party, I can find nuggets of despair. With the IFP, this was a good election. It's really hard for me to find moments of despair. This is the gentleman you're looking at in the painting you should recognize well. That's Mangasutu Butelezi. Besides for uh, Professor Butler, can anyone identify the man looking at him? Vilen Consini Chlabisa. He's the new leader of the IFP, a very low-key man. First I election for IFP with Mangasutu Butelezi not leading the party, although uh, you don't see many IFP billboards in the Western Cape. In Gauteng, Butelezi was still gracing the billboards in the highway, and I'm sure because of Natal. They had a very, very good election. I thought that in places like Newcastle and places like Richards Bay, the EFF would be the main beneficiary of people who are not going to vote for the ANC and coming to the ballot box. The IFP was the main beneficiary. I knew the IFP would do well in places which were impoverished, in places which had little contribution to the economy. I didn't expect them to do well in places like Newcastle and Richards Bay, I'm mentioning those two towns a lot. And they did well in places like Durban, Etiquini. 
The RFP had a great election. They were a force to be reckoned with and because we didn't tell politics again. There were signs of that in 2019. It was much more pronounced in 2021. And the million dollar question now is, are Jacob Zuma's great gift to the ANC was how he consolidated support for the ANC in KwaZulu-Natal. What happened in KwaZulu-Natal in this election was seismic. One, a lot of ANC voters stayed away. A lot of them decided to either vote for uh, the IFP, the EFF, or rural parties. But certainly the IFP, I would say, so not rural, local parties. Um, the IFP was the main beneficiary. On the road to 2024, are ANC voters going to come back um, or are they going to continue to flee the party in KwaZulu-Natal or stay away? And is the IFP going to continue to be the home for many of those former ANC voters as it was in the local government elections? If that's the case, the 2024 provincial elections are going to be very interesting for the IFP and very interesting in KwaZulu-Natal. The six foot seven. Um, so the IFP is obviously a winner. Uh, so I imagine many in this room didn't vote for the Patriotic Alliance. I imagine many in this room might be repulsed by the fact that a former convict, a former bank robber, is got under one percent, which did far better, as I said earlier, than Patricia in its elections. Uh, I think a lot of South Africans. South African who paid the price for his horrible deeds, who rebuilt his life, who has, uh, who has written a book which has, I imagine, sold far more copies than Maya Fisher French, far more copies than Anthony Butler, and far more copies than Brent Meersman. Um, I haven't got a copy of this book, but apparently it's one of the top selling books in South Africa. Now, what, why did the PA do so well? Um, I would say that this is the closest example of what we'd have to a party um, in the deep south of America. Uh, the Republican Party in the deep south of America. You go to their rallies and it starts off with a one hour of an evangelist coming up and offering spiritual counseling to the people in attendance. Then there are the calls. We know in America the Republicans like NASCAR rally. Uh, he wanted to legalize spin. Now, what's spinning? That happens on Four Tracker Road in Belleville on a Saturday night. Stream down Four Tracker Road and do crazy spins. There's quite a number of car accidents where, which happens uh, like that, and I think loss of life. He wanted to legalize it. I talk about the PA. People in the plot line speak about pa, father, almost as if this is, a, this is the paternal solution to our problems. And he's met. come back to him. Certainly a winner. Uh, Peter Grunewald and the Freedom Front, they continued to grow massively. I actually expected them to do slightly better in the Northwest, but this is a guy um, who took over a dynasty. I mean, uh, the Freedom Front was like a, a family party led by the Mulders for many, many years. He takes it over and he continues to grow the party. You're going to see the Freedom Front in more governments across South Africa, certainly in the Western Cape, where they brought the DA under 50%. And they had a very, very good election. It's clear that for many Afrikaners, particularly Afrikaners in the rural areas, and Afrikaners in places like the DA is not currently speaking to them, and the solutions are to them. They have movement in Chwani. Um, and after the election, I'll explain in that particular metro. Um, winner in the elections of the Freedom Fund. Herman Mashaba was also a big winner in this election. He took a huge gamble. He only contested six municipalities across the country. Usually when politicians make their debut, they debut national provincial elections. He debuted elections. Um, and if he failed, Action SA would be a stillborn project. It wouldn't run, probably run in the next elections. He banked on those three municipalities in KwaZulu-Natal and the three metros in Gauteng. And that risk 
that ability, that decision to focus on just six municipalities paid huge dividends. Action SA is a major talking point after this election. To be honest, they would have been an even bigger talking point if he had the mayoral chain around his neck, which he doesn't have. But I think there's a lot of uh, generosity and goodwill to it. You're seeing, look at parts of Johannesburg, in Soweto, picking up 15% of the black vote, of the township vote. In some of the suburbs, picking up 18 to 24% of the, mostly the former DA's vote. This is a party with incredible future because they are tapping into township voters and suburbs. This is what the DA was on to in 2016. He has done it remarkably well for his first time round. Can he build this momentum going forward when he grows the party nationally? And the other challenge about Action SA, and I speak about them in my final slide, is can he also broaden his bench in the next five years? He's a major winner in this election, but can he continue to build with this momentum? Just very briefly, until, and then we're going to move on to the next part of my presentation. Local parties were major winners in this election. Um, in, after 2016, Besides for three municipalities in the Karoo and a municipality in Cunnelunt, in Ladysmith, South Africans generally only had the ANC, the DA, or the IFP in control of their councils. That picture has changed dramatically after this election. And nothing personifies that change better than the Malutia Pafong civic movement in Putati Java and Harry Smith in a beautiful part of the country um, by near the top of the Tugela Falls and the Sentinel Hike. Now, what happened there? This is one of the worst councils in the country. And I just want to speak about them because in a way this tells the story of the election. This is one of the worst councils in the country. This was a council where there was a lot of ANC infighting, a faction aligned to Ace Mahashuda, the Secretary General, and a faction aligned to other uh, to I don't want to say I'm a pause of faction, it's just called the non mashule faction. And there's being run, and they decide to leave the party and first try win their wards back as independents. On the 28th of August 2019, they won 10 of their 15 wards back in one by election night, giving the ANC a bloody nose in a traditional stronghold. They form a party. And they not, this was a municipality where I think the ANC was 69%, so thereabouts, in 2016. The ANC is now out of government here. These guys um, won a huge amount of seats and have formed a coalition with a whole range of. I said, Afrikaans South Africans want a party which speaks their language, which understands their needs. Just as I said that the Patriotic Alliance appealed to a lot of colored voters because they're trying to represent them. And part of that, by the way, is the same with the IFP. Maybe a lot of Zulu voters are saying we want a party which represents our ethnicity, our interests first. A lot of, were a lot of South Africans saying that the Latuli House and the DA's head office cannot solve our local challenges, a local party can. And that's another form of ident identity voting, I would say, in this election, that a local solution is better than a big party solution. Oh, OK, one more slide before we move on to the next part. Mus Musi Maimani, this is a picture from 2016, laughing. Those are great days for Mr. Maimani, and maybe these are still good days for him in 2021. Bantu Olamisa, the leader of the UDM, and Musia Lakota from Coke. So Maimani, there were three DA breakaways on the ballot or, or contesting these elections. And with respect, I would say that Action SA, the first DA breakaway, de oh, no, not the first, were the most successful of the DA breakaways. Then Patricia Little's good. And then I would say Maimani's uh, one South Africa movement. He had success in places like uh, Cedarburg, where they now in power there, the local party with the DA, uh, working with the DA and the Freedom Front. 
that a lot of his parties who he endorsed didn't actually do that well. And it's going to be hard for him, I'd say, in the next... I know that he wants to become an independent MP, but I think Mashab is in a much stronger position than he is today. And I would say that parties like the UDM and parties like COPE are in a big mess today. And I think the lesson there is that the IFP are saying, we know that our voters are primarily Zudu. We know that our voters, that we need to spend most of our election resources and time in KwaZulu-Natal, particularly northern KwaZulu-Natal. With respect to General Holomisa, I think he spends more time in the capital city in Pretoria than he does in a place like Umtata, where the majority of his voters are. And he's lost a lot of those voters. And this was an election where I think people were looking at, as I said, identity was part of the solution, and he what didn't do well in this election, and COPE will probably cease to exist. So some of these parties, which have broken away from that ANC, and to some extent the DA, didn't have a good election. Now let's move to what happens after the election. And uh, this is in... It's basically sequential, i.e. you can go fact check me afterwards in my days. I'm not just trying to tell a nice story here, but this does essentially add up. I don't expect you to know the guy on the left-hand side of the screen. His name is Guy Peterson. He's the new mayor of Beaufort West. And why do I do, use this photo? Um, you can see in the background are people in light green. Those are Patriotic Alliance supporters. In the days after the election, the ANC does a deal with the Patriotic Alliance. And this is great for the Patriotic Alliance, but in a way, good for the ANC. Here is some momentum for Ramaphosa, a party which has done well in this election, is choosing to work with the ANC. Even though the ANC has done poorly in this election, they are still choosing to work with the ANC. This is a good sign. This means that the ANC is able to hold on and actually regain some Platteland municipalities in the Western Cape. And Mr. Peterson from the Patriotic Alliance is one of those mayors because in the coalition deal, even though the ANC did better than the Patriotic Alliance, in I think seven councils across South Africa, they're Patriotic Alliance mayors because of these coalition deals. Let's just go to the bottom right-hand screen, and that is Al Jamaa. Smaller than the Patriotic Alliance, but they did okay. It's a Muslim party. They are also saying, we will work with the ANC. So the ANC, we knew this before the election, but they affirmed it after the election. The ANC is building some momentum. Then we go to the top right-hand screen. Um, I am always used to pre-election promises being broken, not used to post-election promises being broken very quickly. The IFP, Mr. Khlabisa, made a speech soon after the election saying that they will not work with the ANC. And this was a major blow to the ANC. And then on Cyril Ramaphosa's 68th birthday, president, um, uh, 68th birthday he, President Ramaphosa, got the ultimate birthday present. That's it. Thank you. Um, where Butelezi, the non nigerian President Emeritus of the IFP, not Klebisa, is my understanding, says we'll work with the ANC for stability. So this was the post-election promise being broken, the IFP promising voters after the election we're not going to work with the ANC. Four days later, they reversed this and saying we are going to work with the ANC. And I was like dumbfounded. I said the IFP loses by this decision. It means they can't govern in places like Newcastle and Richards Bay, which would be amazing for them. And so what, just to bring this all together, the ANC has a lot of momentum now because they have a coalition deal with the PA, the IFP are now saying they'll work with them, and parties like Al Jamaa are going to work with them. While this is happening, Jordan Hill Lewis becomes, and I think he spoke at the press club, becomes the, the, young, the youngest ever mayor of the city of Cape Town, the youngest ever mayor of a metro in South Africa. There was a somewhat uh, inspiring story or inspiring sto historic event that the DA won Ugeni Howick outright, and they got this young mayor, Chris Pappas. And it seemed, even though he hadn't been voted in yet, that the DA would hold on to Chwani. Now, this is a very, let's just go off on a slight tangent here. The DA loses a lot of ground in Chwani. They lost about 24, 25 seats, if I remember correctly. 
However, they find themselves in a stronger position today than they did before the election, despite the dramatic drop in results. Because between 2016 and 2020, 2021, they were dependent on the EFF, and council was chaotic. Despite them losing 20, uh, 20 plus seats in this election, they find themselves in a position to form a stable government with Action SA, the Freedom Front, and parties like the ACDP and COPE. And that, so the DA, even despite this embarrassing result, is actually in a stronger position today. And I think that had a lot to do with turnout, that ANC voters in township simply did not show up to vote in this election. And voters in the suburbs said, we, we might be upset to the DA, but there's Action SA and the Freedom Front, and they turned out in their numbers. So Randall Williams becomes an important player, and at least the DA knows that they'll have a mayor at this stage in two of the eight metros, but they fell short in a lot of others. And let's now deal with Nelson Mandela Bay. I know that Helen Zilla lives very close to the Calvin Grove Club, but she should be paying her rates and taxes to Kabecha, to Port, historically Port Elizabeth, uh, because of the amount of time she spent there in the run up to this election. Um, because they were confident that they could come close to winning or fall just short of winning Nelson Mandela Bay. The most disappointing result for the DA was probably the result in Nelson Mandela Bay, where they finished slightly ahead of the ANC, but to the same amount of seats. I think they lost, um, they, they lost about 10 seats in Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, so it was a very, very difficult result. Um, I should know that number off the top of my head, but they lost a lot of seats in Nelson Mandela Bay. And having said that, they still thought that they could cobble together a coalition. And they arrive up until two days before the vote, it seemed like they'd cobbled together a coalition. Um, and for Ngaba Banga, a very important lead in the DA to remain mayor there. Very important for the DA to have high profile black leaders and he was a possible mayor there. And at the 11th hour, some of their coalition parties ditched them. I think this was on Monday, the 18th of November, um, which was on a Monday or a Tuesday, and Eugene Johnson becomes the leader, the next mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. And remember I spoke earlier about the ANC doing all these coalition deals, the Patriotic Alliance, they have now regained Nelson Mandela Bay, the most important metro in the Eastern Cape. Can this post-election success story continue? It, the result was terrible, but the ANC are returning to govern councils where they're out of office in t between 2016 and 2021, and now they are governing Nelson Mandela Bay again, and Eugene Johnson is going to be the next mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. This was the start of a dramatic day in our politics. Um, I don't know if there are any WWE fans, wrestling fans, professional wrestling fans, not even those script writers could have scripted. We started in Nelson Mandela Bay where we saw the ANC one up the DA. Something else was about to happen north of the Orange River. Julius Malema wasn't in Nelson Mandela Bay that day. Neither was he in the city of Johannesburg. Neither was he in the capital city. He decided to get into his car, maybe a chauffeur driven, I don't know. And if you know Ha Teng well, Ikruleni is known for quite a number of things, but also a high number of road houses. I don't think you get many road houses in Cape Town. Um, and he would have driven past all these road houses, and he arrives in Germiston at the council chambers. What the hell is Julius Malema doing in this obscure metro on the east rand of Ha Teng? and a stunning development happens. Of all the metros, the hardest, the opposition knew they had a path in Trani. They knew they had a path in Johannesburg with Herman Mashaba and the EFF's outside support. But no one, not the Action SA, not even the DA, thought that they would don the mayoral chain. A fascinating thing happens. Remember I just spoke about the importance of the DA having high profile black leaders in executive positions. The mayoral candidate in this election wasn't Tanya Campbell. It was Rafil Wencheke, the deputy national leader of the DA. She was the mayoral candidate. She woke up that morning having to make a choice. Do I resign from the provincial parliament 
and affect my pension, I suppose, uh, and take up my seat as a lowly council, uh, councillor uh, because the pay is inferior, and just see how the day unfolds. And she made the decision, which I think anyone would have made. No, it's not worth my pension. It's not worth me um, going through the administrative burden of resigning my seat because there's no chance. And an, a DA um, person gets elected speaker, and then Tanya Campbell, the number two, because Ncheka didn't take up her seat, becomes the mayor of Ekuruleni, a stunning development. This was a municipality led by the ANC. It was their flagship municipality, their flagship metro in the north of the country, and that gets taken from them because of one person, one party, the EFF, saying, we are going to punish the ANC. We'll rather vote for a white woman uh, then vote for Zwandila Messina, who, by the way, is a good personal friend of Julius Malema. We all saw when the EFF visited Jacob Zuma, Zwandila Messina, the mayor of Ekurini, was there. That was the first part. And then a few hours later, and I remember I had to put my kids to sleep that night, so I didn't actually see her winning the vote, Dr. Impor Palazzi, and not her Mashaba, becomes the mayor of Johannesburg. Another stunning development. I really thought it was going to be either Herman Mashaba or the ANC incumbent in Port Morani. But remember, on that Sunday, the DA said, we are not going to support Mashaba. And Mashaba blinks and decides, look, I don't know if I have a path, because the DA is still quite a lot bigger than me. And the EFF again votes for Dr. Impor Palazzi. And all of a sudden, after that devastating election result for the DA, even though it's going to be incredibly unstable, they have the mayoral chain of two of all three major me uh, metros in Gauteng. And that extends, uh, this is one of the fascinating stories of this election, this young guy, I remember um, watching the DA's final election rally, like saying, are the DA even taking this election seriously? I'm sure Mr. Gray is a nice guy and, and a competent guy, but he looks extremely young. The same thing happens there. The EFF supporters vote for Tyrone Gray to be the mayor of Krugersdorp, Mahali City, Devilsdorp, for the Showmax uh, documentary. So this is a dramatic 24 hours in our politics. And even though a lot of this has to do with the EFF, uh, the DA at least has the opportunity to govern in places where they haven't governed and govern the three uh, major metros in Gauteng. While this is happening, remember earlier I spoke about the ANC having that deal with the IFP. We start seeing in the outlying areas that the IFP councillors are not listening to that agreement. And we see the IFP take over places like Richards Bay, which is the coal terminal, Newcastle, sent off cement production and steel. And the IFP is no longer a party which we know will govern in, in the deep, uh, it, it, in rural, deep northern KwaZulu-Natal, but they are now governing in coalitions places of economic consequence like Richards Bay and Newcastle. And that is a great result for um, the IFP. Then we saw, and this is a short-lived experiment, we often see these in politics, but the EFF actually got their first mayor in Metsi Moholo in Sasselberg, but because she got the votes from the ANC, she actually has to resign her seats. But uh, Ms. Mochwani uh, will go down in history as the first EFF mayor in the country, even though if it is only for a few days. But again, she will be a side note in our South African political history, but it's unbelievable that in a place like Sasselberg, very, so much industry there, the ANC is getting less than 35% of the vote, I think. A very poor result for the ANC there, and that is why we see EFF mayors emerging, and it'll probably be a DA council soon, mm -hmm. because the EFF will probably back the DA there when they rerun the election. And so, what I was telling you, is that the ANC emerges in this post-election period with a lot of good wins, and then it stunningly starts collapsing. And it comes to a head at Etiquani in Durban, where there is a council meeting where an ANC speaker does get elected, but then there's a uh, um, load shedding and ANC supporters storming the venue. I think they're reading the numbers correctly. 
that the opposition parties were going to coalesce around one candidate from the vote for mayor and that there was a chance that someone called Nicole Graham, a very young person from the DA, was going to beat the ANC. And that meeting gets abandoned, and they emerge not 24 hours later, but almost 48 hours later. I remember being glued to the television, and there was a stunning, uh, I've used the word stunning a lot, a dramatic development where the ANC announced that a leader of a small party, which only has two seats, they want to offer him a mayoral committee. Uh, I don't want to get too technical the way because I didn't tell government works, but they want to put this guy on their list for exco positions. And we see this very close race, and the ANC ultimately prevails because of this guy, a former Jacob Zuma backer in the white shirt, the former mayor of Greytown of Mvoti, PT, PG Mavundla. He decides at the 11th hour to take his two votes and all the, many of the small parties vote back to the ANC. And the ANC with a dramatic deal, I don't want to go into the details of how they did this deal, um, save Etta Kweni. It would have been very problematic had the ANC lost Durban Etta Kweni as well. So this means after the elections that the ANC um, control Buffalo City and Mangawung and Etta Kweni and uh, Nelson Mandela Bay and the DA have mayors in all three Gauteng metros and the city of Cape Town. Um, and if it wasn't for Etta Kweni and this last minute deal, it would have been an even worse elections for the ANC. So briefly, how am I doing with time? Okay. So, will the next five years be better? Uh, we're going to go very far from Cape Town now to a place in the northwest. They breed some game there, a good farming area, called Ditzabotlo, Lichtenberg. Just before the elections, we heard that Clover, the major employer in the town, was leaving town, that they were uprooting because the municipality couldn't provide them with the essential services to keep their business there. Hundreds of jobs were lost, and this is catastrophic. This is emblematic of many places in South Africa where municipalities cannot do the basics for those businesses to remain rooted there and remain invested there. And what is going, we cannot allow more examples of this in the next five years where great businesses which really contribute to employment, to contribute uh, to the financial coffers of the municipality, uproot and leave. In order to avoid that, uh, and I don't like, it's not my nature, I just spoke very glowingly about Gate McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance. I cannot speak glowingly about the man in the jeans. Can it, does anyone recognize him? His name's Marlon Daniels. Does that name ring a bell? Now, Marlon Daniels, with respect, was a one-man wrecking ball in Nelson Mandela Bay over the last five years. Uh, I forget the number of times, I think it's about three or four times, he single-handedly collapsed the council because of his one seat and one vote. He, by the way, just crept into that council. They beat the Freedom Front by a few hundred votes and got that final seat. And we cannot allow Yes, I love the fact that we are a multi-party democracy and that small parties can punch above their weight. But you cannot allow one person to collapse a coalition because of their mood on a particular day or because of uh, them not getting enough patronage or because of their community not getting something they desperately need um, on that particular Tuesday. He didn't just collapse DA government, he also collapsed the ANC and its coalition in their own power. And essentially, Nelson Mandela Bay's council is more remembered for his antics and for that horrible broken glass incident where a jug was smashed on, uh, on, one, of the on one of the DA council's heads. We, I, I think that's another reason why we might have had a low turnout, is that South Africans are saying, parliament and council is a joke. Like, you're not making decisions in the interests of residents. You're not making decisions for the betterment of our city. So in order to prevent um, more Luchtenberg examples of happening, 
We need councillors to understand this is actually a serious job. We need to attract investors. We need to keep businesses in our town. And we need to work hard, even if we've got unstable coalitions, to make sure we serve our residents, because otherwise um, we are going to see more uh, economic disinvestment. We're going to see more democratic disinvestment of voters not participating. And that will be terrible for our country, terrible for our economy, and terrible for our democracy. So now let's, in the final triptych of my talk, uh, the final part uh, is the road to 2024. And I'm going to focus on the ANC, the DA, the EFF, and Action SA, and then I'll open for questions. And this will be a simple uh, pros and cons of what these parties have going for them and not going for them in this election. So we now see in the three, in certainly two of those three Gauteng metros, Johannesburg and Ekruleni, Mohali City, a lot of other places of economic consequence, where there are going to be unstable coalitions governing there because of the EFF not sitting in those um, councils, not sitting in those governments, but sitting in from the outside. Are we going to see more chaos, because there are more coalitions now, in the next five years, then we saw, we saw a ton of chaos in the last five years, or we're going to see even more chaos uh, with the opposition parties trying to run these places, and is that going to play in the ANC's hands? I spoke about the ANC's rural robustness earlier, that this is a party which um, has done a great job in locking the hearts and minds of so many rural voters in this country. Is that trend going to continue with the ANC um, in places like Limpopo, in places um, like the Eastern Cape. However, that rural robustness ca came horribly unstuck in the Free State, where the ANC got 51% of the vote this time around, but in many parts of the country, rural voters are extremely loyal to the ANC, and you want loyal voters when you go into an election. Is Sir Ramaphosa going to continue, get, uh, is his car, going to continue to gather momentum on the road to reform and clean up the ANC, the SOEs, and many key institutions in this country? And will that help the ANC going forward? Um, remember, for many voters, and I think this links to rural robustness, this is the party of liberation. This is the party which gave, uh, which was instrumental in giving millions of South Africans the opportunity to vote in an election in 1994 which built, provided housing for South Africans, uh, which has done so much for South Africans and has helped them in many elections and I believe will help them going forward. Remember earlier I said that the DA got, uh, were only uh, half the size of the ANC in the last local government election. They slightly, it's not as good this time around because they, they uh, only got 22% and the ANC got 46%. Are we going to see their lack of, is the fact that their lack of credible challenges? Yes, there's Herman Mashaba. Yes, there's Julius Malema. Yes, there's John Steenhuisen with all his energy. But none of them, I believe, at this point are credible challenges to Soro Ramaphosa, and that might help the ANC as well. Look, Soro Ramaphosa cannot walk away from the fact that he has been the leader of the party during its two worst electoral performances. Um, they went below the key 60% mark in 2019, getting 57% of the vote. They went below the even more key 50% mark in, the last ele in this recent election, getting 46% of the vote. But I think he's a, e his enemies, I don't even use the polite term, challenges in the ANC realize that if he wasn't in charge, it would be even worse. So do... Do those politicians, do those actors have the ability to look inward now and say, we've got to support Cyril and his program, otherwise we're going to do even worse? The cons. I've spoken about KwaZulu-Natal. It was totally devastating. Can the ANC do something differently there? Or the ANC or Zulu or voters in KwaZulu-Natal are going to say, you treated Cyril Rama, uh, J uh, Jacob Zuma terribly, you treated Zerli Makiza terribly, we are going to continue to not vote for your party next time around. It was clear, and we saw the job numbers recently, that uh, the economy is in a very poor state. Is this going to continue to hamper 
the ANC, how long are we going to live in this COVID time? Will that continue to hamper the party in government? Um, just, and by the way, the term weak bench, I think, is in every single slide going forward. If not Sorrell, then whom? We're looking at a new a top six elections. I can't think of any person right now in the ANC top six or in the ANC parliamentary benches who would do a better job than he's doing. Uh, I, 27 years in waiting. We saw it in this election that younger voters, uh, voters in urban areas just said, uh, anecdotally, I know uh, many examples of this in Gauteng, in, many, uh, in about at least six cities, where people are just saying, we're not going to vote for the ANC. It's just been too long, and nothing much has changed. We're going to vote elsewhere. And is, as I just spoke about earlier, is the ANC just on the march to a slow, inevitable decline? Falling below 60% in 2019, falling below 50% in 2021. Are they going to fall to close to 50% um, in 2024? Is this just a slow, inevitable decline to where they'll one day have to either form a coalition or go to the opposition benches? The DA. Now, when I've, I speak quite often about politics, and I've so the, this slide, I like doing these pros and cons. I said before, after 2019 that the DA was still second, and I said before 2021, it's absolutely vital that if the DA needs to wants to remain a force in this election, they have to finish at least second in the major metros. They achieve that. They either finish first or second. That is absolutely critical. That's why, by the way, in Port Palazzi is the mayor of Johannesburg today and not Herman Mashaba. Can the DA, does this, because I think this matters for voters, that they still want to often give their vote to the party who's most likely to beat the ANC. And you do the numbers, the DA is still the second largest party by quite some way. The DA has the keys to the mayoral office chamber now in all three Gauteng metros. These are horrific coalitions. You wouldn't want this on your best day to be a mayor of a city we are dependent on Julius Malema. But can they make a go of it? Can import Palazzi become not just a star in Johannesburg, but a national star and possibly a future leader of the DA? Um, the Auditor General's grade, I don't need to tell you about this, but DA municipalities in the Western Cape generally performs better than other municipalities in other provinces. And linked to that, I think Alan Windy in the Western Cape will be a key DA drum, which they'll beat on the road to 2024. Let's now do all the cons, and you can see there are more cons, the easy ones. If not John Steenhuisen, then who? Now, I just want to say something. People often ask me, should Steenhuisen resign? I don't think he should resign on the performance in this recent local government election because he inherited the party at a very difficult time. However, I don't think he's the guy to lead them into the 2024 election. So I'm giving... So he mustn't resign now, but if he's smart and the DA is smart, he's not the guy to lead them into the next elections, partly because of things like tone and trepidation. How do you get your messaging right when some of your voters are fleeing to the right and parties like the Patriotic Alliance, and a lot of your voters are saying, we want a party led by a black South African, we want a party which can appeal to the majority of South Africans, and you are not doing that well either. So how do they get their messaging right in the next few years? I spoke about the terrible coalitions, I don't need to expand. And linked to that is that the DA, like the ANC, said we want to be a party which appeals to all South Africans. Their results in 2016 were stunning. In parts of rural South Africa, in some townships uh, in urban areas, they were doing incredibly well appealing to black South Africans for the first time. But as we saw, as, we, as I spoke about the theme of identity, is it going to become harder to be a Rainbow Nation party? I mean, it's seeming like black South Africans are fleeing the DA. Um, and so are conservative Afrikaner South Africans. So do they try be this Rainbow Nation party again, or is that just simply not going to do well amongst the voters? And finally, what is going to happen to the DA when, Herman, when Brent Meersman invites Herman Mashaba to come speak here in 2023? And he addresses the Cape Town Press Club, where there'll be no COVID and there'll be standing room only, hopefully. What is going to happen when he spreads his wings? And will his message resonate in places like Cape Town, places like um, East London, places like Kimberley? 
let's now deal with the EFF. Um, and again, not much has changed in this slide um, because I think unlike other parties, even though we people in this room might not like it, you know what the EFF stands for. They're a populist party. Um, they want land and jobs now. That was their slogan. It will be hard for me to remember any other slogans of this election. It's clear what they want. And I think this is a good thing going for them. The art of the unexpected. Julius Malema has now done it in two consecutive local government elections. This time around was even more unexpected because no one saw it coming. No one thought that after you heard Helen Ziller and John Stiernhazen day after day after day saying, we are not going to do anything with the EFF, he said, I don't care what you think because I'm going to make you, you mayor. I'm going to make you mayor. You, you must never forget that. He did the art of the unexpected. There's an enigma about Julius Malema, and that enigma is even larger, positively larger after this election. Earlier I spoke about Lakota and Holomisa. The EFF is very different to all those previous ANC um, breakaways. They are still around, and even though they're growing modesty, they're growing. They're not falling apart. They are still a force in our South African politics, and you have to credit Malema in that regard. I spoke about this earlier. This is the cons. Why are they not doing well in places like Rustenburg, where their populist message should be doing very, very well? They're losing ground there. Is that linked to the fact that there's an expectation game, that ultimately the flip side to populism is ultimately we populists need to show results? And are his, some of his supporters in the north of the country getting frustrated? Even though he is not sitting in any government, in a way, if he's not the kingmaker, he's the coronator, if there's such a word. He's, he's coronated, uh, he's uh, done the coronation for the DA and um, some local parties across the country. Is he going to be punished by his voters if they feel that his supporters are not benefiting from these coalition deals? And is partly the fact that the EFF is no longer growing in places like Rustenburg and Polokwane linked to that maybe South Africans don't see much romantic appeal to radical solutions to our politics? Is that why they're not growing sufficiently? So that's the EFF. And my final slide, and then I'll, if time allows it and Brent allows it, we'll open for questions. Let's deal with the action essay. This is a party which did very well for its first election, as I said earlier, appealing to voters in the suburbs and appealing to voters in the townships. I think part of it is because Mashaba has a type of populism. He's got a strong position on, um, on illegal immigrants. He's, got a strong, he's seen as an accomplished and established businessman. Um, he's a guy who gets things done, which I think was the DA slogan, but he is a guy who gets things done. And so, as I said earlier, South Africa is your oyster. I think South Africans like this idea of a solution to the ANC, which has similar uh, values and tenets to the DA, which cares about business, which cares about economic growth, uh, which wants a party which appeals to all race groups and, econo um, and classes in South Africa. I think South Africa is his oyster. The challenge for Mashaba is, Staying power. We remember he quit the DA um, and he obviously resigned as the mayor. Was it because that coalition was becoming too hard to handle? Once Action SA starts growing, will it become too difficult for him and will he get out of the kitchen if it gets too hot inside there? Uh, and that is going to be interesting uh, because he left the DA after a short time. Will Action SA have more staying power? The bench, I've said this, uh, I didn't say it to the EFF, but it's also a challenge to the EFF. If Mashaba, to heaven forbid, hit, uh, be hit by a Johannesburg metro bus tomorrow, who would take over the party? John Moody and uh, Mr. Ngobeni are not high profile enough. It would be a major problem for Action SA. I spoke earlier about how important it is for the DA to still be second. The Action SA ran, the, they gave the DA a major fright in Johannesburg. But can they emerge from a 2.34% party to a party who challenges the DA and becomes, not in the next election, but ultimately that South Africans can see that they are the most likely alternative to the ANC and the most likely party to be the official opposition? 
Can they get there? Can enough South Africans say we're willing to take a chance on them? We think they are the future. And finally, I don't think in a local government election that um, it's very hard for candidates for office to come under a lot of scrutiny. In a national election, there are less candidates for office. I think Mashab will come under a lot of scrutiny, and that's linked to staying power, linked to him being able to take the heat. How, well, how will he do in that regard? So I hope that I, that I answered what you signed up for to today. I hope it was worth it. Thank you very, very much, and I'm now happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you. Right, so we're going to open up for questions. Um, I might just, just kick it off quickly. Um, you talked about the IEC, and there were some worrying signs. Um, I know I washed my little marker off my thumb with ordinary soap uh, within an hour of uh, voting. Um, they're making sounds about e-voting. What is your position on that? What do you think of e-voting? Um, look, I know that it's tried in a lot of countries around the world, um, and I think it's been success successful. I, I wouldn't really fear it. Um, I mean, who's going to... If the, if the multi-party committee, which is all the parties who, who engage with the IC are happy with it, uh, I wouldn't want to say no to it. I'm not giving a profound answer, but I'm willing to learn more about it and see more about it. What worries me about the IEC is that you had examples in Nelson Mandela Bay where people were waiting until one o'clock in the morning to vote. I mean, that's absolutely absurd. That no, one, no wonder so many of those people went home. You can't have that in the election. That, that the IEC has got to get right. Right. Um, questions? A question from Paul Hoffman. Thanks very much uh, for an illuminating presentation. And thank you also for using orange as the background color for your slides. How many of the people that you've been talking about today actually belong in jail? And what is your position on those who did not vote? Are they apathetic? Are they punishing somebody? Or are they simply waiting for a more important election in 2024? So I'll answer the second question first. We know that more South Africans will vote in 2024 in a national election than a local government election. Um, I think uh, with regards to, uh, yeah, I think that a lot of the current options are just not compelling enough. Uh, Paul, uh, and that parties have to work harder. Look, this time, this campaign was much shorter, so maybe parties didn't have enough time to get their messaging to resonate. But I think this is a fascinating time, that even though less South Africans came out to vote, even though, um, so the ANC, an ANC supporter might say, look, we, we'll be fine in 2024. Many, many of those voters who came out to vote didn't vote for the ANC. So the ANC, yes, they'll claw some of it back, but this is challenging once you either stay away for the first time or vote for someone else for the first time. It might be easier to do it the second time around. So I think it is very, very worrying, and that's why I think unless there's something dramatic which happens, the ANC's path to a slow but steady decline will continue in the next election as well and each election after that. So with regards to belonging in jail, so on the one hand I spoke about Gates and McKenzie's story uh, being inspiring and resonating with a lot of people. Um, I think that obviously can, hopefully Shamila Batoi will get on with it and we will see some high level prosecutions in the next few years. So I, I think by the way that, that will help the ANC a great deal, particularly in a place like Gauteng amongst its urban voters. So I do hope we'll see that if you committed a crime that you will end up in an orange overall and like the colour orange like you do. Okay. Any questions over here? Let's see. I think you gave such a comprehensive, uh, Maya Fisher. Uh, sorry, wait for the mic, please. Thanks. Maya Fisher French. I am um, the, the the cloud hanging over Mashaba after the EFF tender 
story that came out. Uh, how, how significant do you think that is, um, just at both in coalitions in general, but also on his reputation? So it wasn't significant for voters. So one of the things I was saying, Maya, I live in the suburbs, I'm lucky enough to live in the suburbs in Johannesburg, and I just thought, I remember speaking to a lot of the DA councillors there, and it's like, our voters are unhappy with Mashab because our parks are in a perilous state. So I thought, and I remember also with Muslim voters in Indonesia and in Marlborough Gardens near Santon, he did nothing to stop the land grabs. And I again thought that if, if suburban voters and voters in Indonesia and Marlborough Gardens are not happy with Mashaba, then they're not going to vote for the election. And many pockets, they did vote for him. So I think that, again, in a local government election where it's not just national and the nine provinces, where it's, multi, it's ward, it's metros, it's other provinces' metros, it's very hard to focus on a scandal and focus on scrutiny. And I think Mashaba did evade that. Um, so it was fine this time round, but I think he's definitely going to run for Premier or President in 2024. And I do think when he comes under scrutiny, those that issue the, the, the EFF tender story you're talking about will get more airplay and might be more devastating for him that time. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, do, I don't think the story is over, but it didn't impact him electorally this time around. Uh, Prof Butler. Well, thank you very much, Wayne. Um, slightly difficult question. It would be very useful to know what the, uh, what the outcome of the 2024 election will be. And I wondered if you would uh, be kind enough to let us, let us okay. know. Okay. What so, is the outcome of 2024 election? Um, the ANC will regain Limpopo. Um, Will the DA regain the Western Cape with an outright majority? No, I, I think the ANC will end up between 50 and 54%. I mean, that's a wide gambit. So I do think they're going to lose ground. Um, very hard to say. I think the IFP will be a beneficiary of that. But I, I, need to, I need to catch up on some sleep. But I think the ANC and the DA have a very, very difficult road ahead for them. I do think there'll be new political parties formed. I think there will be a shake of our politics, and it's going to be fascinating. And I'll be at your talk um, in, in, um, in April 2024. I'll purposely fly down to Cape Town. Um, maybe the Conrad Adenauer Stifting will fly me down to hear you, um, and I'll hear you answer that question. Yeah, Thank you very much, Wayne. It's Chris from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. What do you see happening in terms of the quality of governance in this election cycle, or this next cycle, but then also in the medium term? How long do you think it will take for us to find out how coalition politics works? That's a great question. So I want to say something um, to start answering that question. Julius Malema realizes that his path to growth, like in business or anything in life, you need a path to growth. His path to growth is through a weaker, beleaguered ANC. And therefore, this time round, it is in his interest for these flimsy coalitions to do better. Uh, because this is sensational, that the ANC doesn't control any metro in Gauteng, that they've been removed from office for the first time in places like in Mpumalanga, where the ANC have never got under 50% in, uh, in any municipality there. So I think that I'm hoping that politicians will be more mature this time around and say, we have to do this better. Otherwise, the voters will continue to punish us. Because voters punish the ANC and they punish the DA because they were in control of most of the councils. So, and again, I think the EFF could have done better if they weren't associated with some of this chaos. So I'm hopeful, and by the way, this extends to the ANC where they're in control, that they realize that the stakes are much higher this time around, that if you do not perform, that if you do not take residents seriously and the business of 
service delivery and local government seriously, you're going to be punished in future elections. Um, and you're going to be booted out of office and be made to read my, every single one of my official French's books because your personal finance will be a disaster. So I'm hopeful for that. I think it will take a few years for us to see that. Um, to, uh, to, to see that difference. Because if they don't get it, it's terrible for voters, it's terrible for the country. Right. Um, I think that was, I didn't see any other hands. Right. Well, then it remains for me to thank you very much, Wayne. We'll certainly have you back uh, before the next, uh, the next election cycle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you.